Okay. Okay. So we're just going to um, speak about ultrasound of the wrist. Um, so ultrasound of the wrist once again is um, very important that we understand our anatomy uh, of the of the area that we're looking at. And the most important uh, picture that I've found is actually this one here out of Netta, um, which is a, a brilliant diagram because it separates all of the extensor tendons of the wrist into compartments. And the boning landmark that we need to be very familiar with is this Lister's tubicle. So the extensor tendons course over the dorsal aspect of the wrist uh, and they're separated into these little uh, uh, cortical depressions and held in place by the extensor retinaculum that goes over the top. So if we have a look at um, compartment one, uh, this um, compartment houses uh, the extensive pollicus brevis and abductor pollicus longus. And in Australia, um, we see a lot of decurvain teno, stenosing tenosynovitis, so it's very important to understand the anatomy in this area. Uh, it's important to remember that um, the APL and EPB may be in a single sheath or it may actually have two sheaths um, in, right next door to each other. So when we do injections into this, it's very important to make sure that we put the steroid around both of the sheaths of um, these tendons. So the procedure to uh, image this is quite simple. We just get the, I sit the patient uh, on a chair beside the bed. And just with the patient resting their arm on the bed, uh, I do not use any standoff media or anything. I just plonk the probe directly onto the wrist. And you get this result in image. So the APL is the larger uh, of the two. And you can see that the EPB is right next door. And it looks like this is in a single sheath. But it's very common that there's a little separation just in here that you don't always appreciate until you start doing the injection. So this is a case whereby we've got a thickening of the tendon itself. And we've got a large amount of fluid sitting in the sheath surrounding the tendon. Using color Doppler, we're able to see hyperemia within the tendon itself. And the APL, it's very common to see these little um, hypoalkylic cliffs going through there. And this is just the orientation of the tendon fibers. That's not partial tearing within the tendon. If we slide a little bit more dorsally, we come to compartment 2. And this houses uh, the extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi radialis longus tendons. This is the two tendons here, so the compartment one is over here. 
and you can see that the nice round tendons in transverse and you can see the um, extensor uh, retinaculum going over the top. Uh, the next one across is compartment 3, uh, which houses an uh, extensive pomicus lomus. And this uh, extends down uh, onto the base of the uh, thumb, distal phalanx. Um, some of these tendons are much easier to see in real time. So I always use um, quite smooth, uh, steady motion when I'm looking at tendons and just following their path. So you, so you can see here, this is a, uh, extensive pollicus brevis coming out from its bony ostracle, going over the top of uh, extensive carpi radialis lomus and brevis and coursing across onto the um, base of the thumb. This junction here where the tendon crosses uh, over the um, extensor carpi radialis, uh, almost and brevis, uh, is important because you can get a syndrome called distal intersection syndrome uh, that occurs at that site. And it's just due to the anatomical relationship of that tendon coursing over the top of these other two. So just moving a little bit more dorsally, we come to compartment four. And compartment four houses um, most of the tendons, so these are all the extensor tendons of the hand. It's just so these are the extensor tendons, and we've got the flexor retinaculum that goes over the top of it. It's at this location that sometimes this retinaculum looks quite thick. Uh, but that is a normal thing to see. So this is an abnormal um, case of uh, tendinosis within extensor digitorum. And you can see that there's quite a marked amount of fluid uh, surrounding the tendons. And in the longitudinal plane, this here is actually the extensor retinaculum and we've got fluid proximally and distally to the retinaculum. As we move across to compartment 5, um, this houses extensor digiti minimi. And that inserts onto the uh, proximal end uh, of the middle, fifth uh, middle and distal phalanx. So once again, this is a very small tendon. And this is it here, just coming up and then coursing more towards the middle finger. So as you can see, these tendons are very small and we need to use uh, dynamic scanning just to try and familiarise ourselves uh, with that anatomy. Um, a dynamic image is much easier to diagnose of than a static image. This is a case where a patient presented and they had um, a snapping of their little finger when they moved it. And you can see that there's quite a bit of fluid around it. And in that dynamic scan you could actually see the rotation, so that was accounting for the snapping that the patient was feeling. Uh, next, we move across to compartment 6, which is extensor carpi ulnaris. 
and it's coursing down on the ulnar aspect uh, of the distal wrist. Um, and it can be affected by um, tenosynovitis or also uh, instability due to um, deficiency in this retinaculum that holds it together. And by utilizing dynamic scanning, uh, we're actually able to see if this tendon submuxes out of that groove. So once again, just using dynamic imaging, we're able to just watch the course of that ECU as it comes down from the distal wrist over the uh, radiocarpal, ulnar carpal joint and then extending down onto the thalax. Uh, another important structure that we can only see a little bit of on ultrasound and MRI is much better at looking at the deep portions of uh, is the uh, triangular fibrocartilage. And its main function is to provide stability to the ulnar aspect of the wrist. And it uh, absorbs the mechanical forces um, due to uh, wrist axial loading. So it's like a shock absorber to the wrist. But as you can see with ultrasound, uh, we can only really see the superficial aspect uh, of that cartilage. And uh, quite a bit of uh, insufficiencies happen in this deeper part that we can't see, and unfortunately that's where MRI uh, provides better imaging. Um, another important ligament to assess is the scapholunate ligament. And uh, it is located uh, just distal to Lister's tubercle, so just distal to that little bony bump uh, just here. So as we move distally, the first thing that we come across is this little uh, ligament. And it's common for us to see um, hypoechoic thickening or tears or ganglia coming out from that joint. So you can see here this little um, structure just here. This is the ligament just going between the lunate and the scaphoid. So if we move along to the palma aspect of the hand, so we've got the um, extensor uh, flexor retinaculum extending across from the um, pisiform across to the hamate, and you can see that uh, just here. Um, so it goes by two names, either the transverse carpal ligament or also the flexor retinaculum. Um, and it's important because this is where the median nerve actually passes deep to that retinaculum. So with patients with carpal tunnel syndrome, classically they get um, impingement or um, compression of the nerve as it comes underneath that retinaculum. And they get uh, neural distributions or numbness or tingling uh, in this aspect of the hand. But this is quite variable because everyone's uh, uh, nerves supply slightly different parts of the hand. So this is more of a classical uh, presentation for carpal tunnel. So this is the nerve here, so you can see it comes up and then passes deep underneath that uh, retinaculum and then goes down to supply the fingers.
đây là thần kinh giữa nó sẽ đi hướng từ đầu về phía ngón tay và nó sẽ đi dưới cái mạch điện gân gấp sau qua phải mạch điện gấp sẽ không nhánh cho các cơ ngón tay and once again you can see the individual um, nerves just going down supplying um, the thumb and the two fingers here and Đó also and the radial aspect of the index finger, uh, ring finger. So when we're looking at the median nerve, I just once again get the patient to pop their palm up. And with the transducer just in the, the crease of the wrist, we just scanned um, you know, a short period before and after the retinaculum. And we assess that both in uh, longitudinal and also transverse planes. So this is the nerve here. So nerves are, are quite easy or are easier to identify in a transverse plane using a really nice smooth uh, transducer movement. So as I said earlier, the nerves actually go up between the muscle planes. So what we're after is uh, the nerve and then we're able to follow that up and over. So this is a nerve in transverse, so you can see that it's got these little more uh, thickened hypoalkoic um, little fascicles, which are the neurovascular, uh, sorry, which are the neural bundles uh, in the nerve. And in longitudinal plane, once again, you can see those um, hypoalkoic channels. Um, and then we've got the epineurium uh, on the outside, which is slightly echogenic. And as I illustrated before, it, it's important to move um, the muscle, uh, move the tendons. So this is the nerve sitting over the top of the flexor tendons. And what we want to see is a, a nice um, smooth movement of that nerve as, as we're just getting the patient to very gently uh, flex and extend their fingers. What we sometimes see in this plane is, this is the retinaculum here, when you get them to move their fingers, um, that is adherent underneath the retinaculum so it doesn't move. So there's also another uh, embryological remnant called a persistent median artery. And what you get there is you actually get a bifid median nerve and you get an artery sitting in between it. Um, so this is an important finding to um, relay to the um, treating surgeons uh, because they don't want to go in and um, unexpectedly hit this little artery when they're trying to um, you know, separate the retinaculum. So it's important to mention this. So this is a case of carpal tunnel syndrome. And as you can appreciate, there's a definite calibre change uh, between the abnormal nerve proximal to the retinaculum to the nerve underneath the retinaculum. So this is just another example. So we can see here that the nerve comes down, it's hypoalkoic, it's thickened. This is the extensive retinaculum and you can see that calibre change and then it thickens up again at the distal aspect of the canal. Số một á, là đường kính trước sau của thần kinh giữa trước cái vị trí chèn ép. Cái số hai á, là ngay cái vị trí bị chèn ép nơi mà mà chỉ gân gấp dày lên và cái số ba á, là về phía bàn tay của thần kinh giữa nó tăng tăng cái kích thước trở lại. And if you just have a look at the measurements here, 
uh, it goes down from 3 millimetres to 1 millimetre back to 3 millimetres. So that's quite a significant compression. And it was due to this thickening of the retinaculum. So instead of having that nice, thin uh, uh, flexor retinaculum, you can see this is quite thickened once again at 3 millimetres. So the role of um, car ultrasound in carpal tunnel syndrome um, is generally not to, um, it's just to confirm if there's anything else pushing against the nerve. In Australia, generally, um, the patient or the doctors are happy to treat this clinically, um, but they refer for imaging if they're concerned um, that there might be some extrinsic compression on the nerve. Because there's a number of cases whereby we've done the imaging and the nerve looks normal, the patient have then gone on to have nerve conduction tests and has proven that there is carpal tunnel syndrome. So our role is really just to make sure that there's nothing else within that carpal tunnel uh, that could be causing it. So as you can see here, uh, this is the median nerve and there's a large um, calcific uh, heterogeneous um, collection just here which is pushing on that nerve. Um, another area that we're asked to look at is the ulnar nerve or Guyon's canal. And this is the nerve as it comes down deep to the transverse carpal ligament, but it doesn't go underneath the um, flexor retinaculum. And it's easily identified by uh, it lies immediately adjacent to the ulnar nerve, uh, ulnar artery. So this is a, a normal appearance of the ulnar nerve as it's coming down into the wrist. So some patients present with paresthesia uh, in this area here and it can be due to um, the ulnar nerve, some compression forces uh, in this area. And depending on where the compression occurs, um, the ulnar nerve also supplies some motor function to the wrist, so sometimes, or to the palm of the hand, so sometimes they get weakness in the hand as well as sensory changes. So this is a, an image of the ulnar nerve just here, right next door to the artery. And compared to carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar neuropathy is actually quite rare. So once again, we just need to make sure that there's nothing compressing uh, on this little nerve that could be causing the symptoms. And in this patient, what we've found is that there's actually an accessory muscle um, that's coming down and compressing on that um, nerve as it's entering into the um, into the wrist. So this is the, the accessory muscle just sitting here and this is the nerve sitting underneath it. So the compression is caused by this accessory muscle. So once again, uh, using um, you know split view or dual imaging, you can see here this is the symptomatic uh, right side uh, with that accessory muscle and the artery, 
and this is the asymptomatic side with the normal uh, artery and nerve. As I alluded to earlier, um, there's a few um, conditions where we get uh, a condition called intersection syndrome. And this is where um, two tendons uh, cross each other or muscle and tendons cross each other. So there's actually two. There's a proximal uh, intersection syndrome which occurs just about here and a distal intersection syndrome that occurs down in here. So this is an example of proximal intersection syndrome. So this is extensor carpi radialis uh, longus and brevis. And this thing over the top is actually the muscle belly of the APL and EPB. And what's happened is there's thickening um, and hyperemia uh, as those muscle, as those tendons and muscle cross. And we see this presentation very commonly uh, in rowers, in elite uh, rowing uh, athletes. So you can see here, this is the, the normal side and this is the abnormal side. So you can see that there's quite a bit of thickening uh, change between those two sides. So once again, this comparative view by uh, using the dual screen uh, imaging is very helpful for diagnosing this. So this is just another case. So this is the APL EPB coming across the ECRL. And you can see how um, inflamed this area is just due to that hyperemia. And you can also appreciate over here that there's interstitial uh, edema, so there's irritation in the soft tissues as well. So this is just in the longitudinal plane. Once again, we've got the APL and EPB muscle coming across, so that's in short axis, uh, and this is the long axis of ECRL. And once again, all of that um, edema and hyperemia. Um, another condition that we see on the volar aspect of the wrist is a thing called pronator syndrome. Um, and this gentleman uh, presented with uh, pain on the vulva aspect of his right wrist after playing a lot of guitar. So you can see here that there's quite a bit of thickening of the um, pronator quadratus muscle, so this is the radius and ulna. And as you can see, just by once again using that comparative view, using dual imaging, there's quite a bit of thickness uh, difference between the right side and the left side. Uh, another thing that we commonly see in wrists are ganglia. And these can arise from either um, a tendon sheath or a, or a degenerative joint. And they've got variable presentations. And uh, what we commonly do is inject the ganglia to try and rupture the ganglia. Uh, and we use do that just by using local anesthetic and steroid. Um, and we've found that there's about the same occurrence rate for doing it 
with an injection as opposed to surgery. So another common finding uh, that we see in the wrist is, is gout, um, but we don't see um, as much gout in Australia as what I believe there is in Vietnam. So um, there's three stages to gout. So we get the acute gouty arthritis um, and the, you know, the critical or intermediate gout and also chronic or the typhosis gout. So um, they've found that there's the, the double contour sign uh, which is sensitive uh, for looking at um, crystal crystalline arthrography. And we see that both in gout and also in CPD, or CPPD, which is pseudo gout. And uh, in a recent uh, study done by in the Journal of uh, Neuro, um, uh, Rheumatology, uh, they said that this double contour sign is very sensitive. Um, but it wasn't very specific for either gout or CPPD. So uh, their conclusion for trying to differentiate between the two um, was that if there's still clinical uncertainty as to which condition uh, it is, uh, they always recommended doing uh, a joint aspiration. Uh, and that is something that we commonly do in Australia to try and figure out if there's gout. So um, with the ultrasound we're able to look for synovial uh, proliferation or thickening and also hyperemia. And we can use it for ultrasound guided joint aspirations. Uh, but also equally important is we can just exclude that there's no other pathology going on. Um, so this was an elderly patient who presented at our clinic uh, a week ago. Um, and she had sudden onset of redness, pain and swelling uh, in her piezo quadricultural joint. And you can see that there's uh, quite a large amount of um, gout uh, tothus uh, just in that joint. And you can, this was the resulting x ray on that, so you can see uh, once again uh, a lot of degeneration within the joint, lots of uh, crystalline. Um, changes, you know, bony erosion. So, um, this lady also presented with a history of gout, so it was more of a case of is it gout or is it something else? Uh, commonly, we're asked to look at uh, lumps in the wrist as well. So, commonly, it's going to be uh, a ganglia, but we need to also be mindful of neuromas. So, this is a patient who presented uh, with a lump uh, in their thena eminence, uh, just here. Um, they had no previous trauma, uh, but they had had melanoma previously. So, so the differential was, is this a, a melanoma met, um, or is there something else going on? 
và bệnh nhân đó có cái tiền căn là bị u melanoma cho nên bây giờ cần siêu âm để loại trừ nó có phải là melanoma hay không So as you can appreciate, there's this hypoechoic mass um, within which corresponded to the lump. And it had uh, vessels coming into it as well. But we were able to join it up with the little nerves. So this was actually a, a little neuroma uh, in his thumb. Um, the other thing that we're asked to do is um, do uh, interventional or administer corticosteroid uh, for tendinosis and, and uh, you know, inflammatory conditions. So this was a patient who presented uh, with pain on the dorsum of her wrist. And when I was examining it, it had quite a bit of fluid in there. She was quite sore, but when I put cummer on, it was very, very florid. So this was more than what I'd expect, more cummer or more hyperemia than what I would expect if it was just a simple tenosynovitis. So previously this patient had had a, a very bad uh, fracture of her wrist that required um, internal fixations with plates and screws. So I was a, a little concerned that there was something else going on. And after looking a bit more, I was actually able to see that uh, they'd used the incorrect lengths of the surgical screws. So these are actually surgical screws extending up into the um, extensor, uh, extensor tendons. Um, so this lady was very grateful for her surgeon to get her wrist restored. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, they didn't do a, a great job at measuring the screw length. So in this case, uh, we did not do the injection uh, because we were concerned about inf- the uh, introduction of infection into the surgical site. Uh, and we sent her back to her doctors for a surgical review to see if they can fix that. Um, this was another patient who presented with a plate uh, in the distal, uh, overlying the distal ulna. And you can see here that this is the surgical plate just here. But once again, there's uh, quite significant hyperemia around that uh, plate. So once again, we were reluctant to inject uh, around around this site as well. So uh, we sent them back to their doctor and said, um, what would you like to do? Um, and they ended up coming back later um, and we did inject around that to try and settle it down. Okay, thank you.